Good evening, and welcome to New Foundation Unity. This is our fifth in the series of six on exploring the faculty of judgment. We will be reviewing tonight Samson, uh, the judge Samson, and then we will continue uh, with the next judge, Samuel. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties, email mark at truthunity.net. And before I forget, I will just tell you the phone number here. If you would like to call in, ask a question, make a comment, 816-301-6304. 816-301-6304. I will announce that again round about 8 o'clock. Um, so if you have questions before then or comments, write them down and save them for later. And now as we begin our time together, I invite you to close your eyes and turn your attention within. And as you begin to settle in to the source at the center of your being, silently affirm, I am a spiritual being. Acknowledge the presence of God, knowing that you are always in the presence of God. But now we take this moment to be consciously aware that we are in the presence of God and that God is present in us and as us. And for a few moments in the silence, let us rest in that awareness that this is the source of all good, the solution to all challenges, and the promise of fulfillment in all our endeavors in the silence.
And now, as we begin to return our attention to this time and this place, we give thanks for access to this source, the place of clear discernment, of judgment, fair, balanced, unimpeded, where we can say yes or no. Both are very necessary. And now, as we begin to more fully return our attention, become aware of the sensations in our body, we give thanks for the source that we always carry within us at the center of our being. And we say, thank you, God, in the name and through the power of the Christ that lives within us all. Amen. Last week, uh, we talked about Samson, a very colorful character. And as I was reviewing Samson, it occurred to me that he probably more than any of the judges so far represents the kind of collective consciousness that we are all in. Namely, that we have been told, at least intellectually, that we are spiritual beings and yet, we are still dominated by a, a desire for outer experience, a desire for sensory experience. And there's nothing wrong with a desire, either a desire for sensory experience or anything else. Charles Fillmore said um, that there's nothing too wicked to desire, be it a glass of whiskey or a new dress, because all desire comes from God. Desire from the Father. Now, sometimes those desires, because they are filtered through a, a, a consciousness that is um, not fully um, awake uh, to the truth, of of their being, and it comes out very distorted and corrupt. And so in this story of Samson, we obviously have an imbalance between the thinking nature and the feeling nature. Um, it becomes quite clear as we go through the experiences of Samson. Now, Remember, in the here's the historical setting, that the Israelites have been under the domination of the Philistines for 40 years. Okay, 40 years. That means, and that's why there's a disruption or an apparent disruption in this cycle here. Because the people that is, the thought people, are so dominated by Philistine consciousness that there's nobody to cry out to the Lord and say, please help. And so it's like that passage in Isaiah that says, before they call, I will answer. Know that in the subconscious, there is that desire um, to be free, to escape from the influence of the Philistines. That, that dominant human consciousness which says um, that what I see out here is real and what I want, it doesn't matter how short-lived or what the consequences are, um, I want to experience everything. Um, I want to uh, 
experience, everything, and what you have at the end of the day or at the end of your earthly life is a whole bunch of experiences, and which is not necessarily a corresponding growth in consciousness. Remember Jesus' words, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then everything will be added, and you will have a clear perception of yes or no. Yay, yay, or nay, nay. It's clear you cannot serve two masters. Um, I don't think you out there can see this, but I brought them to show because these little cubes here are paperweights. And it's to remind me, this one says yes, and this one says no. And then it has it in all different languages, so you can't pretend like you don't understand. So it has it in French, oui or no, <laughs> or ja and nein, German. Even ja yep or nope <laughs> in the vernacular. Okay, so here's yes and here's no. And we'll see how Samson measures up. So what happens, the birth of Samson, it has a lot of similarities to the birth of Samuel, which we'll talk about in a minute. But the wife of Manoah, the angel of the Lord, comes to her, and she has this vision that she's going to have a son. She, she has no name, all right? That should give you a clue that... Um, it's, it's just a kind of generic reference to the intuitive or subconscious nature. So the vision comes to her, and all that she is told is that um, three things to not do, okay? The husband wants to know, Manoah wants to know, well, how do we care for this child and what is he here to do? And well, he's here to begin, it is stated in chapter 13. He is here to begin to overcome the Philistines. He is here to take the first step. And he actually does. And he learns by very hard knock kind of experience. That's one way to learn. You know, so, so the three things that, um, that the woman is told that must be, okay, no strong drink, no eating of unclean food, and no cutting of the hair. He's to be a Nazarite, and it, it is for life. Now, most of Nazarites are not always for life. John the Baptist was for life, and so is Samson. They usually serve a term, kind of like, uh, you know, a, a training period, but for Samson, it was for life. Okay, now let's consider for a moment what that means for us. Okay, he knows because his parents have told him that this is a special birth. He has a purpose for being here. We all have a special birth. We are all consecrated to God before we were ever born. We all share that purpose of being instruments of God's expression. We are all here. We all have particular strengths, okay, gifts, talents, and we are here to use that particular talent in service for our own fulfillment and for the upliftment of all. So he's been told that, and perhaps you have too, but perhaps all of us at some time or other lose sight of that purpose and being dominated by Philistines we say yeah I'm a spiritual being but do I know that I'm a spiritual being 
um, how do I begin to develop an awareness of that truth, that I'm a spiritual being? Um, okay, so let's think for a moment, what does it mean to not have strong drink? Now, let's just look on an obvious level. If you've ever had too much alcohol, does that impair your judgment? Yeah. If you have ever eaten a whole lot of junk food, okay, does that impair your judgment and your health? And Yes, of course. Um, we'll talk about the hair in, in just a moment. But we're not just talking about physical wine or alcohol and and food that is junky. We're also talking about the junk thoughts that give rise to the desire for junk food. So what are those thoughts? Uh, we have desires for, let's say, something, something sweet. And this something sweet we know that, not that there's anything wrong with sweet things, but you remember how Samson, this is the first violation of his vow, he sees honey um, that has been made by the bees on the carcass of the lion, which he killed. Okay, so here, he's already violated. <coughs> So do we want a sweet experience, a very short-lived sweet experience, knowing that there are consequences for that? When we don't keep our vow, that means we don't really honor that spiritual part of our being. So guess what? He doesn't tell his parents because he knows he's done something wrong, all right? Um, <clears throat> And so that's that, like, short-term, this is not good judgment, all right? Um, very sort of short-term <coughs> um, sensory experience, and never mind thinking about the consequences of that. Now, the first thing he tells his parents, <coughs> now, this is when he is ready to begin his work, and he tells his parents, that he wants them to go find him, go, go arrange for him to marry this Philistine girl. And the parents say, maybe that's not such a good idea. <laughs> if you have kids, uh, do you have judgments about whether their partners are, and he said he wants it anyway, that she pleases him. So apparently she's very pretty. Um, and interestingly, it says that his parents did not know that this was from the Lord. Perhaps the first step in overcoming that consciousness of the Philistines is actually acknowledging that that's where you are, okay? That you come face to face with a desire, and just maybe, have you ever had the thought that maybe you could change things from within? <laughs> you know? Um, everyone knows that the Philistines are, have been not very good rulers. <laughs> um, and so, um, it's all arranged. And, of course, there's this wedding, and a lot of drinking goes on at these Israelite weddings and at Philistine weddings as well. They worship the fruit of the vine. And here's where Samson shows um, a, a definite Philistine characteristic where he, he delivers this ill-conceived kind of swaggering bet. He says to the 30 men who are his groomsmen, he says, um, 
if you can solve this riddle, and of course only he and his wife know the answer to the riddle, if you can solve this riddle, and it had to do with the lion and the honey, um, then, uh, then if you can solve it, I will give you 30 um, garments of linen and 30 garments, festive garments, okay? That's a costly amount. And he's, you know, kind of arrogant because how are they going to know? How are they going to know the answer? Well, it gets to be the seventh day of the wedding and they haven't found the answer. So what do they do? They go pressure his wife, threatening to kill her if she doesn't divulge the secret. And so she does. In human consciousness, women are, it's that part of consciousness, uh, the feeling nature which reacts to fear. And so she gives up the secret because she's afraid to die. And ironically, it's that which actually comes to her very quickly. And so then Samson has to find a way to pay off this debt. And what does he do? He kills 30 men. All right, he kills. All right, here we are with dead things again and despoils them of their garments. And then he's petulant. He goes back to his father, father's house, and you know, and then pretty soon he decides he's gonna go back to his wife. Oh, and when he gets there, he finds that his father-in-law has given her away to his best man. He says, but you can have her sister. She's prettier anyway. So he is enraged and he goes and gets 30 foxes, 300, sorry, 300 foxes. We're escalating here. 300 foxes ties uh, fire to their tails and sends them out into the fields. It's harvest time. So he burns up their harvest. You know, and sometimes in human consciousness, we think if we can take control of all the stuff uh, that it's conquered. No. Well, so they in turn, they then kill his wife. They burn the wife and, the, and her father in their house. And so then he is, <laughs> he is really, you know, you, it, it escalates another notch. And so he then flees and he ends up in Gaza with a harlot. Okay, now here again, you know, yes or no? She's from Gaza and she's a harlot. She's not like Rahab. Rahab sells out to God. This harlot sells out to Philistines. And so the whole place knows that he's there. And they, Gaza's part of Palestine, by the way. It's part of, of the Philistine territory. And, and so they know he's there. So they set a trap for him, waiting for him to come out. But he manages to avoid that, and he flees over to Judah, which is one of the Israelite tribes. And they say, what are you doing here? Are you not aware of the Philistines that are in charge? And he says, bind me with ropes and turn me over to them, knowing full well that he can escape. And he does, and then he has to fight a thousand of them. All right, so more killing <laughs> in order to um, free himself this time. And finally, after all of these experiences, he begins to get the idea that he is not completely, he can't do it all himself. He says, I thirst. Where have we heard that expression before? I thirst. He's lighter. Yes. Um, and 
we all hunger and thirst. Uh, that's what desire is about. We all hunger and thirst, and Jesus says, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Um, we hunger and thirst for experience in this case. And so in response to that statement, I thirst, a fountain, just a spring comes up where he is, just out of the rock, just like with Moses. And he realizes that's the first time he has called on God. And so that doesn't stop him, however. <laughs> um, and, and so it goes on. And then we have, of course, Delilah. We have Delilah. Uh, all of these. Now she's the harlot. No, Delilah. It's uh, this is a Philistine beauty. She actually has a name. All right, which means exhausted. She wears him down in human consciousness. When you long for these feel-good experiences. And it's not necessarily sex. It, it's so irritating to me that this is just, it's so much broader than that. But he longs for this woman. He adores her, or he's totally infatuated by her. And she is a setup from the Philistines to say, what's the, what's the um, source of his strength? You know, here he's ripped up the gates and the walls of Gaza. I mean, he's slain a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. Uh, find out what the source of his strength is. And after four tries, you'd think, you know, that after four tries he'd get it, that, uh, that you can't trust Philistine kind of judgment. And that in the end, his love of Delilah wins out and she in he tells her and so that's when he gets his hair shaved off now it's not the hair that is the source of his strength and if if we were here and it was just us I'd be asking you to answer all the questions okay <laughs> um, but you can be thinking because I may ask you later Okay, um, so it's not the hair. So then there's only one source, and that's God. Okay, um, so what does the hair represent? Um, well, it's his vitality. Yes, it is. It's his, it's his vitality, which is the principle of life. All right. Uh, which is what you can't have dead ideas, you can't have error ideas, you can't, um, you can't ingest things that impair your judgment like that. And, uh, and so when there's that kind of imbalance between the thinking and the feeling, um, there's always going to be disastrous consequences. So as a result of Delilah's betrayal, he is captured, blinded, and imprisoned, and taken to the Dagon's um, uh, temple, the god of harvest and grain and all that. Um, and he has to grind the grain. You know, it's kind of, kind of cool because he had burned down their harvest and now they put him to work to grind grain. Um, He's blinded, um, which is a sign of that once you lose your physical sight, then you have spiritual perception, that spiritual perception grows as a result of losing outer sight. Okay. Um, also, the hair represents growth because the hair grows very fast. I, I've certainly noticed that, that you can cut hair and it grows right back. Um, and even after a person has died, it appears that the hair has grown. And so 
but he thinks it's the hair. So they're having this big festival in the temple, and then here comes uh, the the Philistine idea, let's let's make fun of him, let's use him for sport and entertainment in this festival. So they bring him up, and uh, we do have a couple of interested parties here, don't we? <laughs> and, um, and what happens is that he actually cries out to God for deliverance, and he says, because his hair has started to grow back. So he's beginning to feel some vitality. Um, sometimes it is our greatest challenge that gives us new insight, that, um, that gives us a clue as to what our gift is and what our purpose truly is. And that is the case here. And so he calls on God and says, Give me the strength to bring down this temple. And his, it's granted. It's granted. And so he, he has to be led to where he can touch both pillars of the temple. Notice it's two pillars. Right? And he asks God to avenge one of his eyes. Okay. Not two eyes, but he needs that single eye to receive spiritually. And so it's granted. He brings the whole temple down with 3,000 in it. So we've gone from 30 that he's killed to 300 foxes, which have devastated the harvest. And now 3,000 men are, are brought down, and he has to die himself so he dies with his enemies but you get that sense of what that's the first step he really gets it even though he dies in the end he gets it that you have to cry out to God now um, there is just a, a few points of, so I've told you the whole story but I've told it in order that you can see the sequence of events it's not enough just to know about your spiritual nature. I can tell you, you are children of God, and here are things you shouldn't do. You have to cultivate the consciousness that will allow spirit to live within you. And yes, it involves taking care of the body, but more importantly, it begins, you have to learn to weigh the concepts and the attitudes that either you can say yes or no. And that's how you build a consciousness as well as a nervous system that will accommodate that full flow of energy that will give you that clear discernment, that will give you what it is you need to fulfill your life purpose. So you need to cry to where the help comes from. That's, that's a big lesson that he learns. And he learns that he does have a need, a thirst, which he cannot fulfill himself. All right. And so, so by the time that we start with Samuel, we already have, we start out in a much higher place. So we know that a lot happened, even though Samson uh, did not live to enjoy the fruits of of his labors, so to speak. And oh, by the way, the strength, I wanted to say something about strength. Um, because strength is that faculty, the power of the mind to accomplish, the power of the mind to persevere, the power of the mind to um, keep on, keeping on, all right? It's, that uh, Andrew is the disciple, um, my favorite disciple, the, the disciple who represents strength. And he's the one that supports faith. So a very, a very important role so that outer strength, Samson begins to feel his strength. That's when 
uh, a time comes when you become aware of the kind of strength that you have within you, that at some point you come to realize, I have the strength to overcome anything, any condition, any circumstance. I have the whole um, kingdom of divine ideas within me to work with. And, and that realization is what frees that strength to come through you. And you say, ah, I have a purpose. Um, it's not to <laughs> build your muscles, that, not that kind of strength, but, um, but the kind of strength that says, I know I'm a spiritual being, I know I'm here for a reason, and I'm going to persevere until I achieve that. So this is the faculty of judgment, working with the faculty of strength. And the conclusion of this story is that he judged Israel for 20 years. So they're still in a state of duality. Philistines are still there. But the power of God has been made more visible in this story. All right. So let's see. Uh, so let's talk about Samuel. Um, Samuel. Now he has the. Um, I made this chart so you could see the disruption of the pattern. It's not really a disruption, it's just that the crying out to the Lord comes from within, and that comes very consciously from within uh, with Samuel's mother. Uh, Hannah is his mother. Elkanah, his father, so he already starts out with two very spiritually conscious parents. Um, Elkanah, possessed of God. I have some of the definitions down um, on the handouts. Um, Hannah uh, represents the soul that is favored, um, a state of grace. Um, and it's in that state that you receive what you ask for. And she goes with her husband to Shiloh, Shiloh, the temple, it's, it means abundant good. It's a, a source, all right? Abundant good. And she prays fervently for a son. She is the favored wife. It's kind of a Rachel and Leah situation. Mm -hmm. um, the second wife has a bunch of kids but she has none. And so according to the law, that wife, the one with the children, gets more gifts and favors and stuff. And so she prays fervently for a son. And, uh, and believing, believing that she can have it. Eli, the priest, happens to see her, thinks that she, she is so um, intense in her prayer, he thinks she's drunk. And so he goes and says, why don't you <laughs> kind of come out of this drunken stupor? And, and she explains that she was there praying for a son. And she makes a vow and says, if God grants me this son, I will dedicate him to the temple, he will be a Nazarite. And so she volunteers to sacrifice that son to a life at the temple. And she gets the son. She calls him Samuel, which means heard of God, uh, instructed of God, yes. God hath heard because he was born of spiritual discernment that kind of discernment that has conscious contact with the source within. Okay, now um, she weans him and then takes him to the temple to serve Eli, Eli the priest. You know, so he represents 
the intellect, the will. Um, of course, the intellect can never perceive, can never comprehend the whole truth, but he knows the truth. You know, he knows what the truth is. Um, and right away he recognizes that Samuel um, is Samuel is already spiritually more discerning than he. And I would like to read you this passage. Um, this is in uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1. Let's see, what is it? I, I'm sorry. 1 first, first Samuel um, chapter 3. And it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto Jehovah, before Eli. And the word of Jehovah was precious in those days. There was no frequent vision. All right, so not a whole lot of people were having revelations of God. All right. Um, and it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. So, you know, there's still some light of discernment there. But he was in his place while Samuel was laid down to sleep in the temple of Jehovah where the ark of God was. All right, the ark of God. What's the ark of God? All right. The, the, the torque, the, the well, the, the um, well, yeah, that's what they think it is. They think it's God in this box, but it's not. But the Ark of God is within you. It's the, called the secret place of the Most High. It's that most sacred part of the temple. Um, in Judaism, it's where the high priest goes in once a year, and no one else can go there. And he has to go through all these elaborate purification rites and so on. Samuel, here, little Samuel, that's where he rests in the Ark of God. It represents um, that original spark of divinity. All right, it's the covenant um, that that we all have made. We don't know that we have made it yet, but it's that we are here to fulfill God's desire to express in and through his creation and that we have inherited everything because we have that source, that spark of divinity within us. The original spark is a very sacred, this is from the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, uh, the original spark is a very sacred, holy thing because upon its development depends man's immortality. Um, life is immortal, but if we're not conscious of that immortal part of us, you know, we believe more in death than in life, we believe more in sickness than in health. We believe more in lack than abundance. Okay, so um, this, is, this is a place within us. This is where we go. When we go into the silence, we touch that level, the ark of God. Now Samuel is resting there, and we would like to come and rest there as well. It is represented as occupying the most sacred holy place in the temple and as being protected and cared for with great devotion. That's the importance of the no strong drink, no eating unclean things, all of that, not taking in to mind, body, heart, anything that does not serve the nurturing of that uh, divine spark within us, that precious, um, consciousness that allows us to have access to all that God is. It, it's an awesome thing. 
All that man is has been brought forth from this central spark. Yet the sense consciousness man, meaning the man who lives only in the belief that reality is what I can see, hear, taste, touch, and feel, um, neglects it often and ignores its very existence. Now there are people, I'm sure we, we know people, who, um, you know, maybe on Sundays, they, um, <laughs> when they go to church, they remember that, um, that that is the essential nature of us all. Uh, but then they go home and um, live their life, like completely ignoring it and making decisions and adopting attitudes and beliefs that are nowhere in accord with that. And of course, there are always consequences because, and particularly here, even though the Lord of the Old Testament is the Christ of the New, in that time, the concept of God was God is law. All right? Law. The law is impersonal. It doesn't matter who you are. If you violate the law of your being, it's just like violating the law of gravity. It's just like, you know, uh, if you know the law, but you don't follow it, then there's consequences. That's the law of the universe. Okay? Every action, equal and opposite reaction. Now, you know there's a law of gravity, so you are careful uh, where you step. Uh, you know somewhat about the law of electricity, so you don't stick a fork into an outlet. All right, um, you know, if you do, and if a child does, a child doesn't know, but the law is impersonal, <laughs> okay. Um, so here is Samuel already as a child, and here's how we know, this is in chapter three, um, here, here is Samuel, uh, who, here he is in the ark, in the holy place. Um, I'll go back to chapter 2 in a minute, but I want to tell you about this holy place. Um, so here, here he is. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, all right, low spiritual perception, so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down within the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, okay, and he said, here I am, and ran to Eli. Now, there's a little bit of confusion at first when you hear your name called, when you hear your calling and you think, oh, that must have been Eli, you know, the priest. <laughs> Um, that must have been some authority. Mm -hmm. All right. And so he goes to Eli, and Eli says, No, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Um, he said, um, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. That is, he did not know his oneness. All right. And the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord 
was calling that the Lord was calling the boy therefore Eli said to Samuel go lie down and if he calls you you shall say speak Lord for thy servant hears so Samuel went and lay down in that place okay um, so he then uh, and so the Lord does come back again and he tells Samuel that Eli's house is going to be come to ruin and that he is to be the successor. <laughs> um, and so he's, of course, not eager to tell that prophecy to Eli, but Eli insists, and Eli already knows it anyway. Okay. Um, and so here we have one whose birth is similar to Samson. It's the same, actually. Both Nazarites, both for life. Okay. Um, different tribes. Okay. Samson is from Dan, which represents judgment. Samuel from Ephraim, which represents willingness, all right, will, willingness, Eli represents the will, and Samuel the willingness, they are both there to work on this Philistine problem, and in the end, I don't know if you can see it at home, um, but Unlike Samson, Samuel has a kind of formal training that prepares him uh, for, do, for carrying on the work that Samuel started. You know, with, Sa with Samson, it was only don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this. A kind of John the Baptist representing the faculty, not the faculty, but the power of denial. That's the no, don't do this, all right. And, but Samuel gets, so when you hear that call, you say, speak, Lord. Be open and receptive, knowing that you are being called by God. We're all called. And it is for us to discover the gift that we are called to give. And Samuel turns out to be not only a judge, but a prophet and a king maker. Um, in the Song of Hannah, which is chapter two, um, this is his mother who, who is so grateful that he is, he is born. And chapter two, um, verse, verse one, she said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. All right, already recognizing that strength is within. Um, there is none holy like the Lord. There is none beside thee. One source, all right, one source, not two. Uh, talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. Now, this is in direct contrast to Samson, who was pretty mouthy and arrogant, kind of an arrogant dude he was. Um, and so it's, and then it's, don't sell out. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird in strength. All right. The weak people have to rely on swords and weapons and that, and it's the strong people who rely on consciousness. All right, just read over this song. It's, it's quite lovely. Um, um, and then there's, um, I know it's getting to be time for the questions, but there are a couple more places. Um, I want to talk about because these Philistines are, are still around. And so 
Um, they have this battle at a place called Ebenezer. And I believe I put on your sheet the battle of Ebenezer. And there were a bunch of Israelites that were killed at this uh, battle of Ebenezer. Um, did you find it or no? Okay. Okay. So, um, so at this battle of Ebenezer, the Israelites are losing. And so one of them is uh, the Philistines have this plan, this battle plan. They're going to divide. Okay, they're going to divide the Israelites and march down in between them and attack them from all sides. All right, that is definitely a Philistine. Thing. Yes, that is. What happens when we divide our mind? Our energies are scattered. Um, we don't manage our energies efficiently. We don't manage our time efficiently. Uh, one of my ministerial colleagues had this very wise comment one time. He said, show me your date book, your calendar book, and your checkbook, and I will tell you about yourself. How do you spend your time? How do you direct your energies? Um, and how do you manage your resources? Meaning, not just your money, but your energetic resources. Do you spend energy on things that do not serve? Okay. Um, so anyway, here they are at Ebenezer. And um, they see that they are losing badly. And so one of them gets this notion that they should go get the Ark of the Covenant and carry it into battle. Now, this is just like a scene out of Moses. They think of God as living in that box. So they go and get it from the temple, um, from Jerusalem, and they take this Ark and it's carried by Eli and, and Eli's two worthless sons. And the net result is that the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant. Well, um, they think that this is a pretty big deal. And um, interesting thing happens. So they take this Ark of the Covenant and they take it to Dagon. Dagon, the, uh, the, that's, this is the temple where, you know, Samson pulled down the whole place. And um, I'll, I'll read to you what happens to the Philistines with this Ark. And they end up thinking, this Ark is bad luck. I think we better give it back. Um, Okay, so here's the ark. When the Philistines, this is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5. When the Philipp Philistines captured the ark of God, they carried it from Ebenezer to Ashdok. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day. Behold, Dagon had fallen face downward. Okay, so this statue of their God, this image of their God, had fallen face down um, on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon and both his hands were were 
living cut off upon the threshold, only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. So they cut off his arms and said, this is why the priests of Dagon and all who anger the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Okay, so a superstition arose that this uh, ark had brought them very great misfortune. So then, then they they uh, take it to. Um, um, see where they take it oh the hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors both Ashdod and its territory and when the men of Ashdod saw how things were they said the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us for his hand is heavy upon us and upon Dagon our God there are five cities of the Philistines. And so they want to share this ark with each one of the cities and everywhere they come, these skin tumors and all kinds of misfortune. And so finally they decide they're going to send it back. And when they send it back, here's what they do. They make images out of gold of the tumors that have appeared on the skin. And they hook up a couple of oxen to this cart and they send the ark back <laughs> um, to the Israelites. And of course they, you know, destroy them. They destroy them um, all and make a sacrifice. And so they've got the ark back. And the, the uh, message here is that the ark rests in Jerusalem, which represents that habitation of peace, that it never leaves there, that you can't just carry it around and let it be a kind of your standard for battle, as it was in the days of Moses. You know, that's wandering through the wilderness. They carried it with them. But so the ark always rests in the temple in Jerusalem. And you know that there was only supposed to be one temple. And so when the kingdom later on was divided, this was one of the uh, problems was that the people in the north were cut off from the temple. And so they started worshiping in the mountains. And there were more, um, so there was more than one place of worship. And this was a no-no. So anyway, I just wanted to contrast Samson, who began the work, and um, even uh, Samuel, who does not totally complete the job. It remains for David to do that. Uh, it's David who completely um, united the kingdom. Um, David representing the faculty of love. It's love, that unifying power of the mind. But David does not get to build the temple, which had been destroyed. He does not get to build it because uh, he, he fought battles. He, he waged war in order to conquer everybody. And so it fell to Solomon, his son. Um, Solomon built the first temple. But um, an interesting uh, piece of history, and I know I've uh, over-talked, but um, 816-301-6304, um, oh, and it's, we still have um, 20 minutes. So um, if anyone would like to call and ask any questions um, about Samson or Samuel or the meaning for these, that's the important thing, that you understand that all these characters exist within us. Um, the name is important. The name tells you what you need to know. It tells the potential of what that child was here to do. Um, and everyone has some quality of light that they have to give um, in service. Uh, we all have a role in uplifting 
the consciousness of the world, lifting people out of this Philistine, this desire, this endless desire for looking for fulfillment out there. Good evening, Bob. Good evening. Good evening, Eleanor. How are you? I'm good. How about you? The question about the light in the temple. And um, can you uh, talk about uh, was the light always in the temple and and the light was beginning to go dim um, when uh, Samuel, the young boy, was there. Can you talk about that and explain that a little? Yes. Um, okay. Eli... Um, represents the intellect, and he had been a priest. Um, he had access to the ark that was in the temple, but he was fading. Okay, so he was his eyes were beginning to grow dim, meaning his power of discernment was on the decline, and you know also because of his sons who were corrupt, and um, he knew that he was going to be replaced because of, because of his sons who were corrupt and he was losing his vision, all right? So he was not receiving the visions, but he had enough vision to see that Samuel had direct contact with the source which is why he was in the holy place where the ark resided. The problem came when they took the ark from the temple um, and carried it around, uh, you know, in that, in that battle. But we all have a faculty of judgment. We all have a faculty of discernment. But that, that all the, the Philistine aspect of consciousness, that desire as seen in his sons. They were greedy. They broke the covenant. They um, were irreverent toward the people who were, came there for sacrifice. And all of that contributes to a kind of decline in the consciousness of spirit that needs to reside in the temple. But it's interesting that Samuel then... Uh, goes out and he becomes a prophet and that he you know meets Saul and we'll talk about all the things he does next time and uh, the people come to him for for counsel and um, they want a king and so he he has that capacity that we all have but with him it's well developed of going within making contact with the source and receiving the guidance and actually following it. Um, and that's a big step in advance of Samson. I said, it's, um, so tell me where you are on this. Well, I, I guess I, I, I was asking because coming from a Roman Catholic background, there was always a light in the church to represent the real presence. Would we say that there is a light in the temple for that same reason, and what, uh, I don't quite understand, did the, was the candle lit for just a, cer uh, a certain amount of time because it said it had not gone out yet? I, I don't understand oh, that. Oh, that's, that's a metaphor. Um, as, as far as I know, um, it, saying that the light, um, maybe there was a physical candle or light or something but it's saying that he was not completely um, he had not completely lost his consciousness of spirit due to the all the corruption that was ar around the temple you know experiences tend to erode one's consciousness of of spirit and uh, so it's saying that even though there was all this going on in the temple and the uh, you know, the <laughs> comparable to the selling of indulgences like uh, in the Catholic Church, you know, with uh, the meat. If you read the passage where it talks about how his sons, uh, you know, grabbed the, the meat to, to give it to the priest rather than, you know, giving it to the people to use for sacrifice and so on. Uh, 
all of that, I think it's just a metaphor. I don't think, and there may have been an actual candle, but I'm, I'm just taking it as a metaphor that it had not, that the vision had not gone completely out because he recognized that Samuel had really been called and, uh, and directed him to, um, to answer and to be open and receptive to the guidance that can only come from within and from direct contact. Uh, priests don't have direct contact. They're the mediators. Um, it, it remained for Jesus to tell us that you go direct. Um, I, I guess w uh, one of the things is, is that uh, in, in the New Testament, when it, it, Jesus says, um, uh, know ye not that your, your body is a temple and you are the light of the world, you are the light in the temple. Yes. So, uh, to draw that analogy between that, what Jesus is saying, and, and what is going on here with this light in the temple. Um, uh, the temple, I, I see what you're saying, the temple, the light is growing dim, which, which is, what is referring to Eli's light growing dim. Yes, uh, he couldn't but, see. And, uh, there's a light there, but Samuel is not mature and ready enough to recognize the light, correct? That's right. That's right. And so he thinks that it had to have come from Eli because who else would have called him? He's just a child. And but Eli still has enough vision to say, "Oh, you know, this this is the third time you've come. If you hear that again, you know that you're being called directly from that inner source of light." And the light represents illumination you know it's that illumination from within the guidance that comes uh yeah, yes uh, that's um uh, what was my uh, i had another point on that um i it just slipped my mind but um uh, uh i hate it when it does that um, no, not I, I, I guess i i i'm finished because okay. i forgot what so. i was going to ask oh, oh the other thing is Interesting, he was called three times. The number yes. three yes. Uh, here is significant, he, correct? Ab absolutely. And actually, last week, somebody asked about the number three, because with Samson, there were threes as well. Um, yeah, right. And the, the Trinity, the three, always references the Trinity, um, but there's Trinities, everything. Trinity is the mechanism through which the inner life uh, comes into the outer, visible world. You know, there's mind, idea, expression, uh, spirit, soul, body, um, time, space, form, uh, always from within, and there's, there is that number three. So he was called three times. And maybe we are called also several times, and we in the intellect still being dominant is a bit confused and doesn't understand where that calling is coming from. And, um, and finally, it's Eli, the inner priest that says, oh, yes. <laughs> um, and then that inner priest says, you know, that's a call direct from the source. Um, a beautiful story and there's that song here I am Lord um, right. uh, which possibly was is it I Lord yes is it I Lord yeah um, that I have heard you calling in the night that's right and so it's inspired um, by this passage but when you see light see illumination see um, spiritual perception because that is that inner light that is being um, a judge in the sense of discerning the truth from the error. You know, the yes from the no, um, the sheep from the goats. Um, and it doesn't take Samuel very long uh, to really come into his own. Um, and he was hesitant to tell Eli 
what the message was that he was to give to him about the downfall of his line. Um, and, uh, but since Eli already knew it, he did not take offense. Um, so in these stories of, of the judges, I just find fascinating because, um, you know, it's, it's such a journey of our own development of perception. And how able are we to discern what is truth and what is not truth? And to develop that only comes from contact with the source. Um, if you look to the outer appearances, you'll never get it right. <laughs> you know, you, it's like you go through the hard experiences that Samuel had to, but he did learn that you cry to the Lord within, and it's always fulfilled. Help always comes from within. Fulfillment is already there. My, my, my second question is, and it's more of a comment, um, we can say then since each of these um, each of these judges represent a part of us, that if we go from Samson to Samuel and then David and Solomon, it's the evolution of consciousness uh, in oh, us? <laughs> absolutely. Each, these characters are not people. They're based on historic people, but they're all elements of us and growth in consciousness. You're absolutely right. Uh, we all have a Samson. We all have a Delilah. We all have um, an Eli. And we all have a Samuel. And that just the relationship shifts, um, particularly in these two stories. Is there anything to the, to the, I mean, Samson and Samuel and David, they all have their, their powers. They um, represent powers. Okay. And does that evolution give more uh, credence or strength or um, importance to one power over another? No, I, we've we. Um, Adine just asked if we uh, if more importance is given to one faculty over another. In this portion of our growth, we have to learn oh. to discern. All right. We have to learn to discern what supports the nurturing of this divine spark and what does not serve. And a lot of people are totally, un first of all, unconscious that it's even there. And then others um, are ignorant about how to cultivate and protect it. And then there are still those who know, but who don't follow through with the things that cultivate that consciousness which will support the outer um, expression of that faculty. Eventually, all these faculties, and we have had Abraham, which is faith, we've had Joseph, which is imagination, um, and now we have all these judges which represent judgment, um, in varying degrees of, of expression and evolution. And then we get to David, which is love, where it's righteous judgment. Only when you are, are established in that arc within us, that's when you um, are able to judge righteous judgment. It doesn't always mean that you, it doesn't mean that you don't acknowledge things that are not truth. You have to say, that is not truth, and I do not accept that into my consciousness. Okay, and so we've talked about the amoeba, or I've, I've used that expression before, that these faculties are all developing unequally. Even on different days, you may find that uh, your love is strong and where you're just, you know, you love everything. There's no discernment at all. And then other days when uh, discernment is strong and, uh, you know, and everything is being judged as, uh, 
We've had all of those. And so there's an unequal development in most people, but when they're all fully developed, then it's a complete circle that supports the Christ and provides the channels of expression for the Christ into our world. Um, and it has to first happen within us before it can happen out here. Um, so we um, oftentimes have things backwards, <laughs> and we think we have to change things out here first, but actually the change will never be permanent until we change it in here first, and we get seeking first the kingdom, um, and then everything else will be added. Um, you know, it's, I'm not saying it's, it's easy, but with persistence and, you know, a constant reminder like, yes or no, <laughs> and where did that guidance come from? We're a little bit like Samuel, and we say, hmm, did that come from the minister? Uh, did that come from a voice in the past from my parents? Where, um, who's calling me? And we have a lot of internal voices uh, that are still active in us, uh, pulling us one way or another. So it's normal that Samuel would maybe confuse uh, that voice. But once we get accustomed to hearing it, it's that still, small voice. And it's very subtle, and it requires that you become very still um, in, order, um, in order to pick it up. Remember, it's like setting the trap to catch those divine ideas that come from the source that we can trust and act upon. So yeah, those faculties, they are of equal importance because they can't function by themselves. It's not a hierarchy. You know, people say, well, love is the most important. Well, no. <laughs> love means you know your oneness with everything, but everything is not something. Yes, right. I love, I love my cats. No. I love my house. I love my friends. I love pizza. I love, you know, and you can go on and on like that. And uh, no. So... Discernment, very important faculty. And look how many years it took for Israel to get out from under the dominance of the Philistines. It's interesting, there really were Philistines who, who migrated from the Aegean area um, to the southwest part of, of you know, Gaza, where Gaza is, all the way up to where Joppa is, and it pushed the allotment of land for Dan, which is the tribe representing judgment, all the way out of its place, way up to the north. And so it's this little tiny thing. That's why perception was dim. <laughs> okay, it was separated from its normal uh, place. Um, so those Philistines are hard because we grow, we develop first that human consciousness. We learn how to navigate in the physical world and senses are here. We have them to enjoy, but they are not here to dominate to the point where we deplete our energy simply in these feel-good experiences that uh, have consequences for us um, in consciousness. How do we know? We only know uh, from inner guidance, and sometimes we learn from guidance, and sometimes we learn from hard experience. Um, and yeah, and so that's what all of these have been about. We'll continue with um, Samuel next time as well, because there's much more about how he encounters Saul and how he deals with this question of, of the king, because the people say, you know, these judges, <laughs> these judges, they come and go, and you know, we we want a king. We want someone who will, who will tell us what to do. Don't, wouldn't we all? Wouldn't life be easier if you could just say, um, you know, kind of press a key on the computer and say, what is right action in this instant? 
and and the truth is there's no one right answer for every situation <laughs> you know no uh, you could say um, a table is useful for um, for having dinner right but what if I put a table out here on the sidewalk and it was blocking people's way it's the same table but it's 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 not appropriate for it's doing so we have we also we we use our energies inappropriately um, I know that my teacher said said this that your meditation time is your office hours so that all the rest is recreation your work then becomes the expression of fulfillment from within do not do work that you hate it does not serve <laughs> if you hate your job not good because you're receiving this guidance as to how to use your gift and if you're not using your gift but you're just doing something because of the glamour or because of a paycheck or something you're really cheating yourself out of the level of fulfillment that you could be having and of serving as well so um hey bob you're still there i am thank you elner yeah okay and anything else um it, nobody else has called in, so either they're not watching or um, they don't have any questions. But anyway, thanks so much, and um, I guess if no one else has questions, I'll we'll close for tonight. Um, but thanks. Talk to you later. Okay. Good night. Good night. Okay. So. Um, so for those of you um, who did not get a chance to ask questions, you can always email me. Um, and if you would like to support uh, the new foundation, uh, it's a budding metaphysical Bible school. I, um, I invite you, you can either donate online or you may send a check. Um, and it would be greatly appreciated. And so now uh, hold your love offerings in your hands and take a moment just to be still and remember that the source is infinite. That what is given freely and with love returns to us multiplied. As we give, so we receive. We are part of this universal process of circulation, giving and receiving. We keep that in balance. And as we send our gifts forth, we bless them with our offertory statement, divine love through me blesses and multiplies all the good I give and all the good I receive. And so I thank all of you out there for watching this evening um, please uh, if you're having any difficulty with any concepts um, if you have questions about anything and are too shy to call just email and I will be happy to answer all right and so um, see you again next week uh, next week we will conclude um, it will be more about Samuel but we'll sum up the lessons of each of the judges um, in terms of the evolution of that faculty of judgment. Um, and so God bless you and have a wonderful evening.